Yeah, that's better now, yeah. Okay, so um Stuart, it's a it's a pleasure to meet with you. Um we had a quick chat today on the phone. So just to kind of lay it up before um I was very uh, to, I was actually um you know listening to the interview you had with Eamon Scott. Um I, I hope you don't mind me saying I could see a kind of frustration in you and um you know uh, of course, I see this in, in, in a lot of situations, but I thought it was very well. I thought you communicated very well. And I thought that it was a perfect opportunity the, where you are exactly as a club and your your skills and your, your passion for the game and the way, your vision. Uh, I, I thought it was a perfect opportunity for us to have a conversation which can be you know put online and others can learn from. And... You know, this is what needs to happen. Like, I, I, one of the things that I've seen in football is we all kind of operate in, in, in a kind of like a little cave. Um, and, you know, because of the competitive nature of it, you know, sometimes, you know, what, what one club learns, another one doesn't benefit from, you know, just for the nature of it. And uh, what I see is yeah. uh, tremendous opportunities within this growing, amazing game. And I just... I see it. So that's that's where I'm coming from, Stuart. Yeah. Um, I, I, you're okay with that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. By all means, everyone's oh. got to help each other. You know, a, a club going forty years can pass on news experience to someone like us. I look, I love meeting the older chairman of the game. You know, the lads in it. You know, 30, 40 years we could get on great with a couple of lads. Martin Lockdown down from is brilliant. Bernard over in Bally Moon. You know, I love spending time around them because obviously you the patience of a saint to be in the game that long. You know, I'm only coming up to me 12th year in January and there's days I go, am I doing the right thing here? Am I making progress? Do we pass the mantle on to somebody else? And like anybody else, you're also saying, you know, is this worth doing? Do we walk away and just have an easier life? But then so you fall into the same category of everyone else who's walked away and said, should have done it that way. But you walked away, so your opinion... To me, it doesn't matter. If you're involved, I listen to you. But if you're walking away in football and trying to tell me how to structure things, I've no time for that. No, exactly. And, you know, I in in, in a different kind of way, I, I'm, I'm in a similar type of situation in that I, I see tremendous opportunities where I can use my own skill sets. And, uh, yeah, it's a lot easier to walk away. A lot easier to walk away. But if, if, we, don't do, if we don't do it, who, who else will? And the 12 years that you've put in, in terms of the learnings there, you know, if you walk away, then those 12 years just kind of disappear. And, you know, I've, I've come across some incredible uh, individuals involved in grassroots football. And I suppose um, where I'm coming from is, you know, I've kind of fallen into this uh, position as, you know, having the opportunity to kind of take over from, from Eamon Scott over the next a few years and and become somebody that can add in a, maybe helps for us to collaborate a little bit more so so i see this opportunity and i wouldn't mind just going through kind of a process here which is the first thing Stuart, is um can you just tell us a little bit about your own grassroots journey so just to to, to rephrase this I, I i i'm a big believer in the fact that grassroots football is um is a journey. Every one of us has this unique journey in life, in, the, in football life. And, you know, for some of us, it might last three years, four years. For others, it's, that's an old journey. Probably the most incredible journey is that, that you have as a child with your parents or your dad or your whatever way that that was existed. And then, you know, if you're lucky enough, we, we kind of repeat that process with our own children. And then some of us get into the game and, you know, obviously multiply that effect. Uh, there. But what was your initial um, grassroots journey? I started out in Cherry Orchard at under 10th. I moved on then to a different set of managers in under 11th and they were probably two really, really impressionable people that I still have the height of admiration for because we weren't an easy bunch to manage. No one is these days, but we were tough now. We had a lot of characters in the change room, even on the 11th, you know, a big bunch of lads. But, you know, I was managed by Kevin Kenny Sr. and uh, Christy Dean down in Cherry Orchard. 
freezing cold mornings on the lawns. My father on the sideline with flasks of soup for the other parents that attended. And um, then we'd hang about in the afternoon for my brother to play the under 14 game, and then there, there could be a big all Ireland game on a half two. So you could go down to the lawns at half ten, you wouldn't leave till three o'clock, and you wouldn't have any other way. You'd be playing football constantly after your own game with your buddy. We said, and my pal Peter were playing with Sherry Orchard for such a long time, and his father and my father were, you know, they were synonymous on the sideline for the abuse they gave to referees the schoolboy level. And it still gets my father up to games now. He lives to give out to a little referee on the sideline. And we all know, they've all got time from. We spent five years there. I moved on then to Newland Celtic with the lads I was knocking about in the area. We dropped down a couple of leagues. But I play, again, you know, the admiration I have for my schoolboy managers, I still get a lot of their traits. I still try and look for what would they do. I was managed by Tommy Stack, uh, Terry Crook and Terry Union. Brilliant people. Really, really solid people. Um, we were even worse now to manage. We were a tough group brought away all over England to play games. Went to Puelli as our kids did. And, you know, they didn't have it easy with us. But look, they did get enough respect of us to behave. I took a break for a bit of a while then. I went back playing senior ball with Manor Town. Took another break again. Eventually found my way down to Dublin Bus. Spent great years down at Dublin Bus. Uh, Travelled all over Europe with them. Brilliant bunch of lads. Managed by Paul Doyle Senior and Junior. Tony O'Connor and McGovern. Um, learned a huge amount of Paul Doyle Senior. Learned a huge amount about honesty and just being true to the players. You know, Paul didn't beat you up too often. But if you did, boy God, you must have had a good game. But if you did something wrong, you had such respect for him that you just took it. There was no debate about it. You just took it. Um, I, suffered, I suffered a really bad uh, injury when I was in Dublin bus. I broke my tibia fibula and done my ACL all in the one go. I was in a cast for about nine months. And the club, again, I learned off the club how you look after your players. And the club were fantastic to me. They couldn't do enough for me. Paul Doyle and uh, Christy Murphy, the chairman, who's still there now, couldn't do enough for me back in, I think it was 2005 I did it. And I, I use that method now in my own club that, you know, the players injured, gone to casualty, he's there to midnight, four o'clock in the morning, go up with him, sit with him, buy him a cup of tea, get him a sandwich, you know, just stick by him because I always find that when you stick by the players in them situations, you know, it's what creates the loyalty to the club. And, you know, I learned that trade off the lads in Dublin bus. Then in 2010 slash 11, Kevin rang me up, says, you fancy a change? I says, I do actually. I says, I'd love to win a couple of medals. I know he's winning a lot. So I spent one year playing in goal and um, won the league, played right up to the quarterfinals of the Regency Cup, broke a finger coming towards the end of the game, or the end of the season, couldn't play much longer. And then Who was that with? Who was that with? With Collinstown, with the club with now. Collinstown, so, okay, so that's yeah, how you got, so that, that's how you yeah, got Yeah, we started Collinstown, off as a right? player. We started off as a player, and, you know, I knew the lads, I grew up in the community, it's in my community, so I'm there in my whole life, I know everyone involved, I knew the work they were putting in, we hadn't got the schoolboy set up going at the time, but there was huge uh, plans to try and get it off. Uh, Mighty Carpenter Senior was there, and me and him would go to the meetings together. He'd always be sticking little bits of information into my head, you know, we'll try this and we'll try that. One thing led to another, then I just sort of became chairman by almost default. You know, we were going to meet sponsors, and due to my business background, I was, okay, you know, I was sorry, going to sponsors. Stuart, Stuart sorry, I, I just want to, this is a very important part for me, is the, is, uh, and thanks very much for the initial uh, description of that. And uh, it seems to be that you, you've really picked up things and it's starting to build a picture from the conversation we had earlier on today in terms of your vision and the kind of uh, off the off the off the the off pitch the off pitch stuff that you think about. But just there, when you when you so you joined Collins Town and played senior football, started off as a goalkeeper. But you could see the work that they were doing in the community, and uh, but somebody must have there must have been a vision there, was there? There must have been something that that you you must have said, okay, that that makes sense. And uh, I just want to wouldn't mind getting to know more about that. What made you go from goalkeeper to chairman? Just that little bit of a, a journey there. So again, it was. It was almost by default, Alex, because I was attending meetings with the lads, meeting sponsors, and, you know, the business background I have, that's what I would do on the day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, it was second nature to me. I knew what the sponsors were looking for out of the club. They wanted a return on their investment. So I, I almost created the pathway for myself by going into these meetings. But 
it, the, the beauty about Constant was if I throw a stone in my house, I hit the ground. It's my local club coming up to the big days when we were going to win Premier C and the Cup uh, quarterfinals. Come up, you'd go to the shop and the, the, the senior men in the area would be stopping it, asking it about the club and, you know, is Anto available, is staying back from injury and all this. And it was, it was brilliant. Another brilliant thing that happened within the club was my father would be in the local pub and he'd go over on a Monday night on his own. One of the lads would be there with a girl having a drink and he'd call him over rather than leaving sitting there on his own watching the match. He'd be sitting there with their wives or partners and he'd be, my father would be sitting with them till midnight drinking. And they really bedded him into the club and made him feel part of it, which really planted the seed with me that, you know, this is something going in the direction that I think I need to really put my weight behind. And I think I need to back it entirely. And the lads asked me, look, we want to put a board together. We want to put a committee. We want to get structure and governance. You know, how do you feel about being chairman? So I went away and had to think about because there's no experience. Like, there isn't a... I wish there was a book where you can go online and read about how to be a chairman in a community club because, by God, I've made some mistakes over the years. But look, it started in 2011. First AGM we had, it was voted in, everyone backed it. To be fair to everyone who have walked alongside, you know, I've always tried to make sure that the opinion of the under manager matters as much as mine. The one thing I didn't want to have on the committee and being chaired of it was I didn't want the egos involved. I didn't want someone having a dictatorship of it. It doesn't work like that. It just creates ambiguity. I just wanted structure of governance and I wanted people to be able to push back against me and go, well, I think this is a better option short. And I'd be like, brilliant. It doesn't make a difference who makes the decision once we find the right one for the club and the right one for the players. So that's how the role became about. I'm still here to date. Every year, I think, is someone going to step up and, you know, all they were short for a year, but to just leave me on the front line. But look, as I said, I'm honoured to be entrusted with the futures of 300 to 400 kids. I'm honoured to wear the suit and toy on the presentations and meet the kids and shake their hands and have the crack with them. You know, I walked down East Town Road, I spent 20 minutes trying to get from one point to another by saying hello to all the players in the blue tracksuits. And that's what I love about it. You know, to see a blue one match this. Well, um, that was excellent. And you know, the journey then from I mean, when you when you started in two thousand eleven, you know, yeah, you've over four hundred players now. When you started as you had what two senior teams or or what was it? Yeah, two senior teams. We started out with a schoolboy side. The first year was under ten. Steen Carpenter started with his father. Um, Matty Senior, and some of them players right up until last year were in the senior setup. We came right through the full uh, age groups. They won, uh, they won the Lardone Cup at under 19s, which we were delighted to win. Then we were integrating them into the senior setup, and there's still a couple of them about the club now. And it just it, it really honed in on the importance of don't have a break in the age groups. Like we have a full allocation now from eights to eighteens multiple teams at a lot of them age groups because the pathway will always be strong the seniors will always be okay for bodies if we have the skill boys filtering through and and tell me it just my geography isn't great um it just in terms of the the other local sides that are there what is the uh, nailstown what what are the other t- sides that are there and you know if you hadn't have been there what would have been the situation if you hadn't started started it up like what was the what was the demand like at the time there's huge demand the, the age group that play schoolboy football it will always be high as cordon as a bunch of kids move on to senior football the next wave comes through the next generation comes through and um, there isn't a whole host of clubs left in this town to be greatly honest um and I don't pay much heed to the Alex, and I don't mean that to be disrespectful. I couldn't even yeah. tell you what jerseys some of them wear because I'm that busy with my own club. I couldn't tell you what facilities they have. Like I don't go into meetings and go, well, that team down the road have these Astro pitches and we have nothing. I couldn't tell it. I really couldn't tell you what they have. The only time I see what they have is when we play them. And I, even then, I don't pay much attention. I just sort of focus on what we try to do and focus on what structures we have and not pay too much attention to what's going on around me. Well, you know, in talking in that, then in the in the last twelve years, um, you know, what what for you? What has been the biggest learning curves for you and your club? And what um, you know, what is it that other people can can learn from? You know, what are 
of the key areas that you've learned about the in the process that that people need to pay attention to and just do that maybe look up that book that that, that can teach you to shorten that learning curve yeah the first thing you've got to put into your head uh, as a schoolboy club or a club that's starting out is it's not about getting the authorities to say yes it's about making it impossible for them to say no and you know i've often sat in a meeting with the councils and people and said if you're in my position what do i need to do so i'm putting the pressure back onto them and they need to have to tell you what criteria i need to meet so that was the one thing i found that was really positive uh, in terms of helping us the other thing is the importance of togetherness. You've got to have a devote, you've got to have a united committee, and you've got to have people on your committee that aren't afraid to push back against you as a chairman or a vice chair or whoever you are. You've got to let them voice their opinion. You've got to let the parents have involvement in the club. You've got to make sure that your managers are tilled up to do the job. And most of all, be very, very thankful for the volunteers you do have and don't take for granted um, the work they're doing because in the blink of an eye, you can be very, very short. No matter how many we bring in each summer, I'm still short. I'm still short now. I could do a five more. So, you know, it's a couple of things, and it's just down to just good human nature. Be a good person to the people around you. Be respectful to those around you. And make sure your committee and your club is united. A lot of the a lot of the times we were talking about having a senior committee and a schoolboy committee, and, you know, did splitting the club almost in two under the one banner, and we said, no, we're not going to do it, because there's going to be a nose and them mentality. So we ensured that the jerseys the senior wears, the kids are four years of age are wearing, the tracksuits the kids in the academy wear, the seniors wear. No one's to wear different. No one's to be treated differently. Uh, the, the, what's expected of you as a player is the same at senior level as it is as a schoolboy player. Well, you know, you, you said something very interesting there. I mean, obviously, you're talking about framing the question, you know, a unified board and respect, respect for across for each other, for the players. And there seems to be a real sense of respect there. So those three things are the things that I heard there. But you um, you seem you talked earlier on about uh, your own experience in terms of dealing with sponsors. And that's what you do for a living. And just I'd like to find out a little bit more about some of your um, of your the way you've communicated just now sounds quite businessy. And, and so do you mind if I ask just a little bit about your own business background? Yeah, that's no issue. Um, I'm I'm involved in the roof and a fabrication company. I'm the commercial manager, so I'm tasked with looking after every penny that's within the business. I'm tasked with getting new business in. So a lot of the trades I use in business, of the use in the soccer, and a lot of the skills I use in business, I've learned as a chairman. As a chairman with a bunch of volunteers, you learn to have expectations that are reasonable, not putting pressure on people. So I bring that into business. So there's a lot of crossover between the two. Uh, the, the biggest thing you want when you're talking with sponsors is you need to gain that trust and confidence that if they're going to give you an investment, they're going to see a return on it. If they're a, a roofing business or if they're a natic company who we have on board who's been brilliant to us, that we put people his way, that he can turn around and go, Stuart, I want to be back on board, which is next year. Five people came to me via your club. That's a huge part we always aim to do. Yeah, well, you know, look, um, and this is this is how marketing works you know this and um, so when we were doing the ddsl photographs um <laughs> myself and uh Eamon, so we had like roles and he would do uh, you know one part i'd do another part but one of the things that i was doing was i was going through uh, as he was posting them onto facebook i was trying to put them all up you know we just had but i was struck by one of the photographs that um that uh, that Eamon took and it was of the back of one of your shirts and um it was uh, more than a club i think was the slogan on the back of the number um and also i noticed another thing which was the um the name uh, or the mental health um like a little green ribbon that is also printed on on the jerseys as well and uh, it just stuck out like it just uh, it stuck out for me and um and i i was kind of really interested in, and i kind of looked more and then when 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 Eamon, you know obviously we're mad busy doing different things but when Eamon, uh you know there was a couple of good kind of interactions between us online and I, I don't know who does your social media but there was a couple of you know and then when Eamon went out and took the photographs the other night at your event um you know i was able to see your see your club from the inside out kind of and see the just just 
the overall professionalism and the togetherness and obviously the interview with you. But you see, there's very few people who are talking in your language and uh, and and it's so important. Like this is what the, the opportunity that I see for clubs out there and, and what we're trying to do at Striker Online is we are trying to um, help educate, encourage clubs to realize the power of the content they're already creating. So I think you said in your in your in your interview about how many people play football and how big the sport is in Ireland. And okay, we you know we're kind of uh, we don't get as much funding as we should be getting, but in terms of size, we're the most played sport in the country. And people don't realize that um, every single company, every brand out there is trying to get on mobile. And your children's sport the game that your kids play is always going to be part of your staple diet. So no matter what, it's going to eat up a percentage of the time you spend online. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's always going to be, you know. And um, what struck me when I listened to your discussion with Eamon was I felt that you could be somebody that would understand this and be able to uh, work with us and, and, and try and show other clubs. I'm certainly like, Full. I wanted to help clubs realize the value in the content they generate if they learn how to provide a return on investment for the sponsors. So that's really what you know what I'm what I'm hanging on to here. And before talking about the other more important, I just want to have a little bit more into that because how. How do you see, you just said something really important there, which is you want the sponsors that you have to get their money back basically through business in the short term so that they've no problem yeah. paying again. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's key. That's key. It's You want them coming to you in year two rather than you going to them going, have I given this guy enough, invest, enough return for me to generate having this conversation the second time over? And if you haven't, it's a difficult conversation to have. So we just try and push the envelope in terms of what we do with sponsors. We have some amazing ones, local local builders, carpentry companies, uh, Silk Valley Roller, Bear Ethics, um, to name but a few. And the one thing they would, I can hand on my heart guarantee, if I was to ring them saying, I need a reference off you to, to show other sponsors how well we work with you. But get a grown reference. And it's, it's, a, it's a huge part of what we're trying to do as a club. You have to be able to market them the right way. You've got to market them at the right times. You've got to let your audience see it at crucial times. We were with Boyle Sports for many years. And through the help of Eamon Scott and, and, and the Herald Strike at the time, I could ring Eamon and go, Eamon, we have a, you know, we have a New Jersey launch in December. Can you help me out? And we'd have a center page spread in the middle of December that would have cost Boyle Sports God knows how many thousands. And we were able to go back each year and go, look, we got your three centre page spreads. Look at the audience. Look at how many people bought the newspaper as a result. Um, look how many people have seen your brand. So it was it was a no brainer for them to work with us each year. So that's that's always been our aim is to just give them enough return investment that come June and July they're ringing myself up and the rest of that saying, listen, can we go again? What else can we do? And just just off the strength of the interview when uh, Super Valley Roller. Heard a ploy. Now, to be fair to Sue Valley Roller, William, he knows us really, really well. But it, it must have struck a nerve him because I'm meeting with him now this week to see how we can really up the ante in terms of large scale funding to bring this uh, big uh, plan we have to fruition. Um, so, it, it look, the sponsors we have are, are best in the world. And I, the one thing I've always said about Neastown and areas like Neastown, no other areas will support their own better than working class. I've gone out to some of the so-called more affluent areas, fundraising, doing charity events. I've gone into rugby clubs where there's an endless amount of money and you wouldn't get half as much raised on the night as you would if you'd done it at Finch's pub for someone who's lost a life or a child who needed it. Areas like this are the best in the world for helping their own. Bally Fair, Metalla, I see the revenue that they bring into raffles. Um, and we're the same. I can go into Finch's pub tonight. We've got a 400 raffle tickets. And by the end of the night, they'll be gone. People give me the last fiver to buy the raffle tickets. So, you know, it's a mixture of making sure the sponsors come back to you every year. 
but the people around you buying the tickets on a daily basis that you know they're getting something as well well look the just before i get on to the final part of this conversation this initial conversation by the way because um, there's a lot more to cover but I want to say I'm going to do something for Green Hills. Um, so I saw they posted something where they had the sponsors and, and what, I've seen this. Couple, so what I want to do is I'm, I'm hoping that more of their sponsors uh, that are on that board will send me their handles. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a piece um, on it and try and get the people using the handles more, you know, in yeah. the social media posts more, making sure that, you know, their social media handles are part of it so that, they have something just to share on, you know, it's just the way social media yeah. work, which, which is something that we're working on. And what I'd like to do is also include you in that. And um, so if you want to send us on whatever sponsors are currently working with you, and we're just going to start to, to put a piece together about and make sure that we, we show them, you know, the, the, the activity so that we're able to put those, we want to put, the sponsors handles on all our posts if we're posting something with regard to yourselves we want to be able to put them on or i mean ideally the, the you guys should be able to should have them all on your own you know it, it, but it's hard for for social media managers to you know sometimes to remember or to just get into that process but so we, we'd like to do yeah. something on that so definitely yeah, um, okay but you talk there the, the most important part of this conversation is the vision for the future, your current situation, as you explained, I'd like you just to go through that again and the situation that you're currently in with your 400 players um, and then maybe discuss the vision and a plan, see where you are with that. Do you have some land, gosh, or, you know, where you are exactly? We started out in 2007. We essentially just needed one pitch and with the growth of the club, it's just taken off like a rocket. So as a result, we're constantly outgrowing everything we do have. And when I say what we do have, we're essentially in a county council park. We've three 44 containers scattered in different locations just due to the volume of equipment. We have the housing it, nets, goals for the small sided, and pitch markers, corner flags. So we actually have them in three different locations. So in terms of assets and facilities we don't have anything we have equipment we we're in the pavilion program via south dublin county council where they're rolling out changing facilities in various parts around south dublin i think we're probably two more on the list to go and then air starts and now there's talk of it possibly being changed to a modular system which may quicken it which is brilliant and um, there's nearly a half a million of funding in place for that but I don't think it's going to be enough just with the general price of construction at the minute and labour. So we may have to go for another round of funding. Off the back of that, we're endeavouring to have a full-size floodlit astro pitch simply because we're spending up to €65,000 a year on training alone just from October to March. Um, we're renting out every bit of astro we can get our hands on. There's astros plonked in the middle of public parks that are 300 quid for the game. Like we were up until this year, we were paying 295 for a home game on a flood of Astro pitch that's essentially in a public park. You add in 150 for the referees. So every game we played in intermediate football at home was 450 euro. So you add that by 13, then four or five cup games. The budget just goes through the roof. So that's where the, the, the sponsors come in. So what our general plan is, and off the strength of the interview we're aiming to do night, I, I, I've given it to 2025. 2024, I'm not going beyond them without this getting resolved. If I have to march on doors, if I have to protest outside offices, if I have to go down the route, which I thought I'd never have to go in terms of calling people out and calling out authorities and federations, I'll do it. I'd much rather be a pragmatic person and work with them and liaise with them and say, let's do this together cohesively and not just be going in different directions and arguing along the journey. Have you got a piece of land already for the asterisk pitch? No. No, nowhere, and nowhere. Every, every piece of land in this town is owned by NAMA. Every piece is either owned by NAMA or private developers. So unless any of them see this and they want to donate a small section to it, no problem, we'll build a national day. And the school that you currently play in, you yeah. said you rent a pitch, to, am I right? You rent a yeah, pitch from did. a local school. Yeah, we play in Conestown College. Um, a number of our schoolboy teams play there. Our senior teams are playing there this summer. 
and we rented off the school for X amount each game. It's still a bill. It's still a bill on top of subs each week. No, but I'm saying, is that a grass pitch? Yeah, it's a grass pitch. It, it's you won't be playing past five o'clock. So we still have to move past, the yeah, area. What I'm saying is, I'm just I'm just brainstorming here, Stuart. But you know, is would would turning that pitch into an astro pi pitch help? You see, there's so many obstacles there in front of us. You have the school. We've got to get the go ahead off. You've got to get the boy in from the ETB. We've got to get buy-in from the Minister for Sport. You've got to get it signed off by the Minister for Education because it's on a school ground. So there's about four or five hurdles there. And just getting over one of them is can be absolutely a long process. We have got a plan in the college that I'm hoping to bring to the table. They're all involved very, very soon. It's going to take a bit of over and back to bring it to you know a set of drawings, a set of plans, and see can we start the funding for it. But when you're 400 members and you don't have a single training facility, something's got to give. Something's just no, got to give. This look, 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 we're, we're totally with you. Yeah, yeah, okay. with the area, this wouldn't be the case. Like, if you had 400 players in the rugby club or the Gator club, and I'm not being a martyr here, I'm just telling you how it is. If this was in a, a, an affluent area and it was a rugby club and there's three teams in it, I can guarantee it they'd have facilities. 100% well, they know, would have facilities. It's interesting you should say that because, um, you know, my boyhood club is Turnier Football, uh, Turnier Rangers. I've played with Turnier Rangers and Home Farm as a boy, but, but I played with Mark Milligan and Turnier Rangers in the 73 team. And, um, you know, I was, I was, I've had some dealings with them re recently and, um, they're renting 11 different training areas in the winter. 11. And they're spending, you know, the guts of 80,000 a year. Uh, and they are, you know, their catchment area is one of the wealthiest areas in, in, in Dublin. So I, I, I'm not like jumping up and saying, you know, they're they're playing their football their main pitch obviously they you know they're straight they're all over the place they they rent from Crumlin united they rent from you know up in the, any kind of p any anywhere they can get but they're in a similar situation a massive club i think they're 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 close to 800 members um and they haven't um and they're not able to get a club it's it's very it's i don't understand why more pitches aren't being built because they just get filled up so quickly and we're trying to keep people out but can i just say um i wouldn't mind forwarding this i'm going to send this video to uh liam extravic and some of the people up there because they have a huge amount of experience up in um uh, team fipe they're called but they they've uh, uh, they're all football people but they have a deep deep experience in loads of these situations that you're in and they're, they're giving a lot of free advice so I might um, send them on to see if they can, um, you know, you know, just help in any way. Uh, you never yeah, know. Yeah. Just, yeah. But, uh, Alex, I'll, I'll sit down and have a cup of tea with any man who can make this journey a bit easier. Any man, wherever it is in Ireland, it doesn't bother me because it just seems to be draconian roadblocks and red tape we're hitting. And all we seem to hear is, well, it doesn't happen like that anymore. And you're looking around you and there's facilities and they have that badge on it. But, if Constantine want to do that, no, he can't do that. That's not the way it happens, it happens anymore. But you said something earlier on, which which I I'm not gonna forget now in a hurry. You said that put it put the put the person in a situation where they can't say no. I think that's how you phrased it. What yeah. it said isn't that was that what the way you said it? Yeah, yeah, it's the it's the best way to get what you want is to put them in a position no. where you ask them the hard question. So, you know, something like that. I mean, I'm just asking the question. If you were able to guess, the, the I can see on the on the aerial views that the Constant Community School has a, has a grass pitch, a grass football pitch, right? So if if that could be turned into an Astro, would, like, would that solve your problem? In other words, if you heard that tomorrow there was an Astro going in there that would give you access to, to that Astro, would that solve your problems? It wouldn't just solve Collinstown problems. It would solve every primary school in the area's problems who are renting off other astro pitches in the area, paying neutrons and money. 
Like, if we can get a national pitch in the area, we're throwing the doors open to every primary school in Neilstone that need it. Free of charge. We'll open up the change facilities, put the corner flags out, the nets will be sorted for them, whatever they need. Like, this isn't going to be a money generator. This is simply there to be used by the community. It's What do you get? Council want to own it. You want to put the name on it. You want to have it as the home ground. But we want the schools in the area to use it. We want every primary school in the area that need it to be able to come in and, and have a use of it. We want to do a football for all. We want to do the walking football for the kids that are in the frames. We're getting inundated with requests from parents. Well, how can you provide all them all them safety structures and safe areas to do that with kids? You can't do it in a public park. So where does the woman go to the toilet? There's nowhere to go. You've no running water. You've nowhere to even start a defib in the park at the minute. So it wouldn't be just for Collins Down Benefit. It would be for the wider community, you know, sports events, charity events. A big charity event in the college on Sunday or on Saturday just gone. Hundreds in attendance. Perfect example. Throw the doors open. Let them have use for it. No charge involved. That's the aim of the actual. Okay, well, look, that's uh, let's let's park that. We have a few minutes left now, and I want to focus on the um, the very disturbing situation. And I just want to try and build a picture of it because I I have a good bit of experience coaching uh, girls teams, and you know, um, you know, obviously as a male coach, you just have to, you, you know, you're learning all new things all the time, and you're and you know, your situation is you've no running water, you've no toilets. I mean, it's a lot easy, very easy for boys to, to to sort that out. But for girls, it's a different kettle of fish altogether. What what do you guys have to do to warn your the parents, warn the opposition? What is the process that you have to? You obviously have to tell them that there are no toilets. What what? How does that? What's that feel like? It's it's one. It's embarrassing. And two, it's one of the most uncomfortable conversations you have to make on a Saturday afternoon. When you're letting the opposition know and they're coming out to play. You're wearing we're an all royal blue. What colour you wearing? Yellow. Okay. By the way, get all the girls and the parents to go to the bathroom before they leave. And the thing is, a lot of the teams in the girls' leagues we have, they're off in the north side of Dublin. So it's probably a 40 to 50 minute drive all the way over. And you arrive there into a public park. You can't even change indoors. And there's nowhere to go to the bathroom. So the club made a conscious decision last summer. Said that's it. We're just going to find the fund them to place them in a private ground, hire the astro pitch for the hour and a half that they need. They'll have change facilities. They'll have full bathroom facilities, running water, whatever they need. Because it just couldn't continue the way it was going. No. So thankfully no. enough, we have to we we do fund the girls playing privately on an astro pitch with toilet facilities. They also train in the sports college rather than the park, because you have access to the change facilities and the toilets. But we shouldn't be there. Like, it shouldn't be like that. Like, we've a, we have an equine centre in Nailstown. We have a pigeon club in Nailstown. If them animals want to go to the bathroom indoors, they've that opportunity. But if you're a 12-year-old girl in Nailstown, you don't. Now, there's something fundamentally wrong with that. That has to give. That can continue. That is just not right in 2023 that you're turning around to 12 year old boys and telling them to go into a bush in a public park where men and women walk their dogs every single day where small kids play football. Go into a bush to go to the bathroom. What world are we living in when that's acceptable? And that's just the reality of it, Alex. That's that's it in nuts and bolts of how raw it is. If you're a pigeon or a horse in this town, you have indoor and outdoor toilet facilities. But if you're a 12 year old boy, Whatever club you're in in this town, not just Constant, you don't have an indoor toilet. You have a bush. Well, okay, so so we'll finish on this. Um, it's a very good 45-minute conversation. Thanks so much, Stuart. Uh, but the recent uh, FAI um, announcement about the funding required or their, their plans, their kind of ideas around the amount of funding that grassroots football needs, um, I would see, from my understanding of the the, the, foot, the league table of football clubs out there, uh, you're probably, you know, f- first in line. Would you be, you know, do you feel that you're going to be first in line? or Not a hope. Not a hope. I tell you, there's, there's a problem with the sports capital application where you need to have assets to be able to hit the big numbers. You need to have a section of land. You need to have an existing facility. If you're, if you're playing in a public ground like us, you're capped at the max you can get in one round is 25,000. So you're essentially applying for equipment. I can tell you here now how much we've received since 2007. We've 
We've received eight grand of funding from every authority in Ireland. Eight grand. That's all we've received. Eight thousand euro. Eight thousand euro since two thousand and seven is all we've received, and we're going to continue on that thing until the sports capital changes its way of awarding money, because the people without an asset can't hit the big number. So if you're an existing club with an asset, a ground, uh, facilities already in place, you can continue to apply for more funding. But if you're a fledgling club going five years, like if another club starts up tomorrow in a different park in Town, they're in the same category. They're not going to receive the funding because they've no assets. That has to be changed from the sports capital. It can't be judged on how many assets you have. It has to be judged on your numbers, on your requirements, what you're providing, and have you got your own part of funding. I blew in the face saying to people, I don't want all the money. Tell me how much I need to hit 200 grand, and I'll have it in a week for you. No problem. But I need people to turn around and go, we're going to remove the red tape. We're going to get rid of that issue for you. But until they do that, and, and so many clubs like us are going to be caught behind that. And there's no there's no plan to you, is there a vision to to be an asset back club in other words to have to own your own land is, is that is that an option? We don't even want to own the land, Alex. To be honest, I don't want to own the house. I just want to live in the mansion. I don't care whose name's above the door. I want to have access to it. But the problem is where we are. There's no. It's it's not like if you're in a country club where there's a green field around you that can be donated to the club. We're in an area that's sandwiched with houses. Every bit of green space has houses around it. There isn't green spaces there that one individual owns that you can turn around and go, I'm going to donate that to Conestown. Unless there's massive building contractors out there due to build an East Town next five years, they want to give us a section of it. And, and, and guarantee you to turn on their investment to uh, publicity. Because that's where we are at the minute. Our long-term goal is to get the pavilion programme into Conestown Park, which is the changing rooms, and with the changing rooms, just want to add to this, with the changing rooms, it isn't just changing rooms we want in there. We want to put a men's shed in there. We want the senior men of the early who's given back, paid their taxes for 40 years, sitting around, bored out of skulls now. We want to be able to bring them in, let them have a meet and greet in the morning. They can repair the nets. They can fix the goals. They can wash the kids for us. Uh, we want to provide an after-school club for kids that when they come in from school, there's food there for them. We can help them with their homework. You can go back out into the park and train them because that's the reality in some homes that that's not there and we want to be able to do that and we've an opportunity and south dublin county council have a huge opportunity now to build a legacy style project with Conestown fc that will change the absolute landscape of this community this, it's, this community's gone since 79 and we're still in the same position in, in terms of sports facilities we've a green space but we've an opportunity now where there's a wash with money in the country. Because the councils aren't short of money. We've a massive opportunity now to seize it and do something really, really well in an area and see the benefits of it. And I'll just finish with this, Alex. Right? In 2008, I walked in a young offender's home teaching kids. And at the time, it cost €250,000 to keep a child under 16 in a young offender's institute. So study was done. Can you imagine how much money we're saving governments by providing a positive environment, a safe playing facility that keeps them away from harm, keeps them away from trouble. We're saving them an absolute fortune. They've got to open their eyes and see a holistic approach to this, of how this can happen. If they turn around to me in the morning and go, Stuart, we can do it, but you need 70 grand of your own money. No problem. Give me two weeks, I'll have that for you. I'll pull this out of the bag with my committee and my volunteers. But they've got to get rid of the red tape. It's just, it's gone on way too long. The patience is absolutely shot. The parents have had enough. They can't keep going to a park at 10 o'clock in the morning and having no facilities. We can't keep no. bringing in away teams and looking around the park on a Saturday and seeing a sea of young fellas going to the bathroom in the bushes. It's just draconian. It really is. And look, look, I just wanted so that I visualise it and other people can visualise it. I, I saw the... The aerial view of where you're playing i saw a collinsdown community school over beside it but you basically there's a park there with a number of pitches so when you talk about the pavilion plan right are you are you suggest are you is the plan do you have a plan in place that would put a kind of a pavilion a, 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 a bricked a building somewhere in that park is that what you're suggesting yeah, that's part of the South Dublin County Council's uh, plan is they've, they've done eight in total. 
So we think we're in number seven on the list. So we think they're at number five at the minute. Obviously, COVID put a delay on everything. So the plan is to put a pavilion in that park. And what we want to do is we want to put the pavilion in it with the changing facilities, somewhere we can store our equipment, put a men's shed into it, put an after school club into it, somewhere where kids can drop in and out, meet their buddies, do their homework, have a bite to eat, right in the heart of the park. But all these pavilions are they the same size. Do you have you have you seen the plans for it? Is it the same? I have seen the plans, and it, it changes from park depending on the, the 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 clubs that are going to be applying for them. You know, we have to have six change rooms as a minimum. The numbers are too great for anything less than six. You've got to be the right size for us. You've got to be in the right section of the park for parking, because at the moment there's no parking in the park on a Saturday afternoon. There's two hundred cars along a Neastown Road both sides. There's one set of traffic lights. So I'm conscious of the safety aspect when there's a busy Saturday afternoon in the park. So with six changing rooms in the pavilion, gated, lights around it, you know, whatever it takes, um, that's what we're looking for. And the South Dublin County Council have got us on the list. As I said already, they have a half a million in funding. I'm hoping that's going to be enough, but I genuinely believe it won't. I think we're going to have to go again in the Sports Capital Grant when you come around this year. Well, look, Stuart. Let's uh, let's let's call it uh, a night with that. I want to thank you very much for giving me the time um, on a Sunday night like this. Um, I know you're tired, uh, but I do appreciate. It. I think it's so important just to get these conversations started and to post yeah. these up to have other people just join the conversation. And you never know. You never know where the the next helping hand can come from or the piece of advice or guidance or just what might happen but from from here on there's a number of projects we're going to and think we're going to obviously post this on the various platforms i'm going to do a little bit of work with the your, your current sponsors and obviously with green hills and any other uh, club out there who want to send us the thing we want to try and get you know start something uh, uh, motoring but for now, thanks very much, Stuart. It's been a pleasure talking no, I appreciate to you. Your I look time. forward to more. I appreciate your time. And as I said, Eamon's been a great help to the club. And any, any way we can get our message out there, you know, we, we'll certainly take advantage of it. So thanks very much, Alex. I appreciate it. Not at all. Okay. Good night. Thanks, thanks very much. Cheers. See you. See you. Yeah. Bye-bye.